finding life on Mars has a wonderful, huge importance. Dare I say the first mega discovery of the new millennium. This may give an answer to this very old question, are we alone in the universe? It's difficult to imagine that there hasn't been life before us, isn't life, there isn't, that there isn't life there now, or there won't be life in the future somewhere. In June 2003, a little lander, Beagle 2, will begin its voyage towards the Red Planet. The odds against success are huge, but its mission is great. It's heading to Mars to find evidence of life beyond the Earth. It will be the smallest, smartest landing craft we've ever sent into space. Beagle 2 is the brainchild of Professor Colin Pillinger, who has raised the money for a project that puts Britain on the map of space exploration. The idea goes back a long way. We've been working on rocks that have uh, been thrown accidentally to us from Mars by impacts occurring on the surface of Mars. Martian meteorites, if you will. We've worked on these meteorites now for over 15 years, and it's become obvious to us that the conditions on Mars rather more suitable for life than we previously thought. So we know now that uh, water has been percolating through rocks on the surface of Mars in the comparatively recent past. So, uh, you know, if you've got the fundamental ingredient of life, which is water, then really you should be thinking about whether or not there's any evidence of, uh, of life there. Mars. It's a place of beauty, mystery, and intrigue. It had the most extraordinary power to fuel our imagination. Its seasonal color change and its channels sparked fantasies of alien civilizations. And they weren't very friendly. Across an immense ethereal gulf, Minds that are to our minds, as our minds are to the beasts in the jungle. Intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes. And surely, drew their plans against us. But the Martians of H.G. Wells kept themselves well hidden. During the 60s and 70s, we sent a series of probes, but all they revealed was a cold and barren world, ravaged by dust storms, not a single little green man in sight. For the next 20 years, Mars was largely forgotten, until suddenly, science fact caught up with science fiction. Life on Mars. We think life might have existed at some point on Mars. Scientists investigating meteorites that had fallen in Antarctica came across a fascinating specimen, ALH84001, a rock from Mars. It had hurtled through space and lay undiscovered for 13,000 years. And what a story it had to tell. We may see the first evidence that life might have existed beyond the confines of this small planet, the third rock from the sun. We have a number of forms which are, uh, which it is very tempting for us to interpret as Martian microfossils. The sensational claim that a meteorite from Mars contained fossil evidence of life sparked renewed interest in the red planet. But the claim is still the subject of much debate. Just what are we looking at? It's very, very difficult to keep those samples pristine and uncontaminated. As soon as it arrives in the terrestrial environment, it comes down through the atmosphere, it begins to become contaminated. The same could happen if we go to Mars and return samples to Earth for analysis. 
What we're hoping to do is by taking our laboratory to Mars, we will avoid that step. The Mars rock controversies helped to crystallize a new branch of science, exobiology, the search for extraterrestrial life. One of the leaders in the field is a French professor, André Brac. The Orleans-based scientists urged the European Space Agency to go to Mars with a lander capable of searching for signs of alien life. Mars is our first major objective to find, to find life outside, uh, beyond, beyond the Earth. We are going to look on Mars for this uh, primitive life which is possibly, hopefully, fossilized in sediments near the surface. Every 17 years, the orbit of the red planet brings it close enough to us to make getting there possible on a relatively modest budget. With the next conjunction due in 2003, and with some spare parts available from an ill-fated earlier spacecraft, ASA announced a mission called Mars Express, an orbiting laboratory with room for some special cargo. It was the opportunity Colin Pillinger was waiting for. In 1997, he challenged the UK space science community to build a lander to be carried aboard Mars Express. A multidisciplinary team of planetary scientists and space engineers was assembled from all over Britain. Seven universities and a dozen major companies joined together to guide the project to success. For most, it's the challenge of a lifetime. And when Professor Pillinger dubbed the project Beagle 2, he hoped they might emulate one of the greatest scientific journeys of all time. Charles Darwin travelled on the voyage of the HMS Beagle in the 1830s. It told us a great deal about what we know about evolution on Earth. And because we were going to Mars to see whether or not evolution applied to a second planet, it seemed a very, very not obvious name for us. In a lot of people's mind, it's, it's like a pet dog. It needs looking after, it needs... Uh, taking care of, etc. It was never intended to use the animal connection, but quite clearly, when we uh, take our lander, our model lander around, we wheel it around uh, on uh, our little trolley. We sometimes call it taking the dog for a walk. It's new technology to a lot of people. It's new science to a lot of people. It's uh, an integrated approach. The whole team has to work as a team in order to deliver Beagle 2 on schedule. Sometimes we rub each other up the wrong way, but, uh, but we're all moving in the same direction. I'm just the lucky guy who's happened to have a project that people want to, uh, want to be involved in. So Britain is going to Mars, and it's taking the nation's creative energy with it as well. The project has received some unexpected support from Britain and Fleur. One-time schoolboy astronomers Alex James and Dave Roundtree pulled up Colin Pillinger with an offer. They'll create the voice of the little beagle. After successfully unfurling its solar panels, it will call home by sending out a blur tune specially composed for the occasion. The soundtrack will be beamed back to Earth and will inform the European Space Agency of the successful landing. And something like this, you know, which Ultimately, the question it's asking is, is there, are we alone in the universe? You know, it's, it's a big one. It's a historical, you know, it's probably the most important question in history. But it's the art of the space engineer that will get Beagle 2 successfully to Mars. And that means overcoming some difficult design problems. Biggest challenge is the mass and also the volume. 
we have to keep the size that goes onto a rocket down as small as possible to keep the cost down. But then you have to protect the equipment you're sending into space. We don't have enough mass to have a roving vehicle like was uh, launched on the Pathfinder mission. They had 16 kilograms for their, their little truck trundled around. We came up with this very ingenious idea of having the, the thing we call the mole, which is able to crawl across the surface and uh, then get subsurface samples. The way in which the mole works is it taps itself across the surface. It uses the contours of the boulder to change its direction and then it burrows underneath. And that's the sort of place where we might find some surviving evidence of, uh, of organisms that existed in the past through their, the organic matter which has not been oxidised away. Looking for life is not a single test. It's a combination of tests. You have to look at the, the, the geochemical background, the geology of the planet. You want to characterise the rock. So it means looking at it for its chemistry and using a MOS power spectrometer to get its mineralogy. Now all those instruments are something that you want to bring up in sequence to the rock. All these operations are dangerous. Something might stick, something might grab, something might fall off, or we might not get an electrical contact. Put them all in one place, then you've minimised the risks. Beagle's moving laboratory has been dubbed the pool. This can be manipulated to search for the most promising specimens. The tools that we have in particular are up here we have the X-ray spectrometer. Um, this is one of the first things that we use to uh, look at rocks and, and we can get the chemistry of the rocks. We also have a microscope uh, in which we can obviously look in detail at the rocks. Once we have taken a look at the basic rock, we need to get away the uh, weathering rind. To do this, we have a grinder. We then take a core sample using the corer. You need to go inside rocks. Now, when Pathfinder went, again, it made the elementary mistake. It used a great deal of mass for this rover. It made the elementary mistake of not appreciating that the outsides of the rocks would all be very, very weathered and eroded, places where the evidence that you want doesn't survive very well. What makes Beagle 2 different from any other previous lander on Mars is that it can test directly for the presence of organic carbon, the very stuff of life. And it can tell if it's biological in origin. All of this in a tiny lander that weighs only a little more than a Beagle dog. We're about a tenth of the size of the Pathfinder probe that went to Mars a couple of years ago. And yet, proportionally, we carry significantly more science in that very small, small mass and volume we've got. It's small. The model is a full-scale model. And it's crammed full. We don't have spare capacity for uh, backup systems. If we did put redundancy in, then we wouldn't have a mission because we would be too heavy to, to fly. All the systems on Beagle 2 have to work for the mission to succeed. Beagle 2 has to be perfect. Beagle 2 will be launched from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. It will take six long months to reach its destination. When we get to Mars, a few days before Christmas 2003, there's a very dangerous manoeuvre when we have to separate the, the lander from the mother spacecraft which goes into orbit around the planet. And then, of course, we are most vulnerable when we fly through the atmosphere. When we come to the surface of Mars, we're shrouded by airbags. The bags will be shed and the lander will drop on the floor. From the height of a metre, in a Martian gravity, which is only a little less than 40% of the gravity on Earth. And you think that would not be severe. But still, that's a still a dangerous maneuver because it's just like, if you think about it at home, it's just like pushing your computer off the edge of the table and hitting the floor on, on the side. 
and still expecting it to work perfectly, and that's what we're doing. But having come to a stationary situation, the computer system inside will um, set a sequence of events in motion. First of all, opening the lid of the lander, and then followed immediately by the deployment of three solar panels. Beagle will then recharge its batteries and deploy a wide-angle camera and sensors to have a good look around the landing site. Over the centuries, we've come to understand quite a bit about our closest planetary neighbour. And we've discovered it's not as alien as we thought. It snows on Mars during the winter, and on a Martian summer day, the temperature can be a pleasant 15 degrees Celsius. But it's also a place of violent dust storms and shifting sand dunes. Still, we know places on Earth not unlike this, and in the past, it may have been even more like our own world than we first imagined. There are signs of a warmer and wetter past. There's uh, growing evidence from the images taken by the Mars Orbiter camera and also from the older Viking images for channel networks on Mars showing um, the movement of liquid water. There are two types of channels, the large outwash channels associated with catastrophic floods and uh, the smaller so-called runoff channels. And these are thought to have been caused by the flow of groundwater creating these little dendritic networks. It's possible that it was actually a large ocean at a very early stage. And if there was water, and even oceans, scientists now must seriously consider the big questions. Could life have evolved there? Could life still be there? And most astounding of all, did life here on Earth possibly originate on Mars? Mars cooled down earlier than the Earth, and it was habitable earlier than the Earth. Both could have been abodes of life, or even the origin of life. It's not impossible that life started earlier on Mars and that some part of this life was ejected from Mars uh, in a meteorite and transported to the Earth. So in reality, we, we could all be Martians. In 1976, when Viking went to Mars, we thought that life was a frail thing. Now we know all it needs are nutrients and liquid water. On Earth, we have found life flourishing in searing heat and shattering cold, bright light and pitch darkness. We have learned a tremendous amount about life on Earth in the last 10 years, um, about the variety of, uh, of life forms and the places they can survive. And really, uh, on Earth, uh, certainly within the uh, outer, you know, a few tens of uh, kilometers of the, of the surface, there is practically nowhere where you don't find life. With all its water frozen, Antarctica is as dry as any desert. In places like this, it hasn't rained for millions of years. Wind blasted rocks blind in UV radiation. It is the nearest we can find on Earth to the surface of Mars. Although it appears completely barren, in reality it is teeming with life. It is the ideal laboratory for British exobiologist David Wynne Williams, who studies the limits of survival. Cyanobacteria used to be called blue-green algae. These sorts of cyanobacteria can grow in places where other organisms can't. As the glaciers melt, they provide plenty of surface water, and cyanobacteria grow in really dense mats on the surface. They can also grow on the surface of soil, like on these little soil cores here. We can show how they desiccate, well, how they dehydrate completely, and then come back to life again. We can show how they can live at minus 28 degrees Celsius. They can survive at that temperature quite easily. They can even grow at that sort of temperature. 
They are the microbes that live at the limits, which is why the Antarctic is so important for this life at limits research. It's why it's the interface between the Earth and Mars. Three and a half billion years ago, there were probably oceans and rivers on Mars, and that's when evolution could have started. And gradually, as the planet cooled, the water started to retreat. First to ice-covered lakes, like this one in Antarctica, and later into the rocks below the surface. On Earth, life survives within rocks, even in the most barren desert. I've got a sample of the, the rock here. Um, there are actually layers inside the rock itself. The surface of the rock is rust-colored, nothing on it at all. It's been sandblasted, dehydrated. But inside the rock, this is the sort of impression you get, where you get the surface of the rock rust-stained, then a black layer of lichen, a white layer of fungus, and a green layer of algae. So this is the sort of thing we might well find on Mars in a final stage of water. But after that final stage, it's just a desert. However, the evidence of past life on Mars could still be there just beneath the oxidized surface. But with an entire planet to choose from, how do you select the best landing site? Well, Chrissy is interesting because it's got hundreds of millions of years of history of uh, flood deposition, which uh, could be interesting from the exobiological point of view. And that's our John primary Bridges site, has narrowed the search the down to two possible sites. For ESA to he had to compromise the, uh, between safe landing the and one. finding the best samples. Uh, our backup site is not without uh, problems. Uh, I think it's got some of these uh, features it, called mesas on Earth. That's right. Tritonus is covered by about 1% of these sort of table-like mesas. This one, for instance, is about 360 metres high. The slopes are rather dangerous. I don't wouldn't want to bounce on that first bounce. No, there's got to be a bit of a compromise between the engineering constraints and um, the ideal scientific terrain. But uh, I think there's plenty of potential to land in an area which can be suitable for the sort of experiments we want to do. But even if they land successfully, the search for life may still throw up some totally unexpected surprises. What will life on other planets really be like? Flight to Mars! I'm not making any rash assumptions about what life on Mars might be like. We're only assuming that it uses carbon. The problem comes if life is sufficiently different, it's not carbon-based or it's based on some exotic chemistry, there's a chance you might not even recognise life. You might go there either with unmanned or manned probes and walk right past a life form and never know it's there. So the universe is full of possibilities. But whatever form life comes in, evidence that it exists beyond our planet will profoundly influence our own lives. It may help us to explain our own origins. Well, we still don't know this. The answer to this question is what triggered the transfer between inorganic organic matter and living organic matter. Now, maybe, just maybe, Mars actually did see an equivalent uh, beginning of life and that record perhaps could still be um, retained there. But if you find it on your adjacent, on your neighboring planet, <laughs> and you can recognize it as life, it'll look different from us, of course. It won't be you know, from like H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds or anything like that. But to have it so close, it, it has, to, has to stretch the sort of theories of evolution. Finding life on Mars will be a good indication that life on Earth started with simple molecules because it is repeatable. It repeated on Mars as well. So this means that life is probably everywhere. Life is possibly universal, very common and universal. Big issues to be solved by a little beagle. Only about half of the probes we have sent to Mars have made it successfully. So beagle will need luck as well as science. Sooner or later, though, these are questions we will need to answer.
you could worry yourself sick about what could happen to Beagle too. Our fingers have been crossed since day one and won't be uncrossed until uh, 180 Martian days after we've landed. We have to stand on that launch pad and believe that we've done a good job. Thank you.